I had an extremely strange encounter that I just had to put into words to see if anybody can make anything out of it. I was with my niece, who is on her high school soccer team and is taking it pretty seriously. She's attempting to get some kind of scholarship out of it. I am pretty healthy and don't really work out too much, but something I often do is run and hike. I live in Kentucky. Not in a rural part, but there's a state park near my house that's 6,500 acres, so it is pretty secluded and densely wooded. There are some really nice trails that allow you to run for a good chunk and then hike for a bit to split up the long bits of trail that are flat. She decided to tag along with me today for a quick three to four mile run. It was raining, but nothing too heavy. Kind of a spitting rain. Nothing we can't handle. We got up to the peak of this one hill, and it had been about two miles or so, according to our phones, so we decided to turn back and head back to the car. As we were headed down the steep side of the climb, we were walking pretty slowly, making sure that we didn't lose our footing. Out of nowhere, there was the coldest chill that came from behind us once we made it about halfway down. At the time that it happened, we both commented on how cold it was on our backs, but we didn't make too much out of it and went on with our conversation. In these woods, there's some wildlife, like small deer and I believe maybe some coyotes, but they tend to stay away from the paths. At least, I have only ever heard them in many years of coming here, but never once seen them. The only thing that I've ever seen of them is a few tracks. Once we got off the hillside and hit a stretch of trail that was flatter ground, we began to pick up the pace when a deer darted across the path, maybe 10 yards maximum in front of us, causing us to stop in our tracks. The first deer was then followed by three more, and not one of them even so much as looked our way. My niece looked at me puzzled because of the oddity of this behavior. To me, they were acting like they were running from something, like a predator of some sort. Once they had gone, we started back with our run, and we heard a noise behind us. A loud, booming noise of something of substance falling to the ground from some height. When we stopped and turned, we saw nothing. No animals scurrying away like one would expect after such a substantial noise in the wilderness. In fact, everything was calm eerily calm. Just as we looked to each other to ask what was going on, there was yet another cold wind gush through the valley, pushing all the rain off the leaves surrounding us and soaking our sweatshirts. I was starting to freak out inside, but was doing my best to stay calm for my 17-year-old niece, but I'm pretty sure she could tell that I was really freaking out. I said, come on, let's get to the car, and we turned to take off again and there was a man, leaned up against a tree on the side of the trail, dressed in a black suit, with a white button-up shirt on. His collar was opened, but he had a tie on, sagging like a tired businessman on the way home from a long day. It startled me at first. I was not expecting to see anybody for a few reasons. One being we were, at the very least, one mile away from any parking lot or street. Another being that we never heard or saw him coming and the stretch of trail we were on was flat and open for a good half of a mile. I got over to put myself between the man and my niece as we jogged past him. When we did, I looked him in the eye and gave him a how you doing nod as we went along. He was sort of pale, his eyes were very white, but his irises were ice blue. Everything that I saw from the quick look I got up close looked to be clean-cut and proper. I didn't notice a single speck of mud on him anywhere, and the two of us had it caked on the bottom of our shoes and even the backs of our pants and shirts from kicking it up on us as we ran. We had to get to the top of another hill, smaller than the last, but still quite the hike up. Once on top, I took a quick look behind us, and he seemed to have vanished without a trace. 
Now with having the vantage point of the hill, I could see out past the trail and see most of the hill that she and I had just come from, yet he was nowhere in sight. I scanned off the sides of the trail and still nothing. My niece asked me who that guy was and why he was out so deep in the woods wearing a suit, questions I simply didn't have the answers to. We made it back to the car with nothing else out of the ordinary happening to us on the trail. As we came to my car, I pulled the keys from my pocket and unlocked the doors from maybe 10 feet out. Walking up to the only car in the entire lot, I noticed muddy footprints coming away from the car door from the driver's side. Weird, considering I had no mud on my shoes when we got there. But there are trails leading up to the lot, so I figured maybe somebody came through before we got there, and I didn't notice. However, when I pulled the handle to open the door, it was caked with mud underneath. Almost like somebody was attempting to open my door with a muddy hand. Nothing more happened, but the entire encounter leaves chills all over my body the more I think about it. My mother and father divorced when I was eight. I lived with my father until late 1995. I was 13 when I moved in with my mother, but in 2002, I had a falling out with my stepfather and ended up moving back in with my father. My father lived in the country, while my mother lived in a small town. My father's home was surrounded by forests with few neighbors, situated on a hill. When I was a child, I used to walk through the woods, so I knew them really well. In 2004, my father's home burned to the ground, and we left the area, moving into a small town and living in an apartment. I ended up in college, studying film, and I was tasked with making a film. I decided to shoot a short film about a serial killer stalking campers in the woods, because I was really unoriginal at the time. So me and my two friends, Adam and Zach, were looking for locations. I figured the forest where I used to live would be perfect, because it was in the middle of nowhere, and there would be no sounds. So we did what you would normally do scout locations. One for the campsite and routes the protagonist and antagonist would take through the forest. We arrived and were deep in the woods. At this time, only one person still lived in the area and he wasn't home. Nor did he own all the land, so we stayed well clear of his property. As we were moving through the forest, trying to find the perfect clearing, all was quiet, which was startling because although we were in the deep woods, the sounds of birds and bugs were kind of a normal thing. It was in the afternoon, so there wasn't really any reason for the forest to be so silent. We came across a clearing I knew, but it was different somehow. When I was a child, deep in the forest, there was an old wooden structure, flat, that we called the stage, because, well, it looked like a stage. It was in a clearing, right next to a tree line, with a wide field that could fit hundreds of people there for a concert. Whether that's what it was, or it was something as simple as the floor of an old shack, I don't know. All I know was that when I had gotten there, there was a camper, and someone built a pond right in the middle of the clearing. We decided that somebody was clearly using the space, so it would be best to find a different spot. We went to the tree line and descended down a steep hill to a creek. All the while we were talking to ourselves about how the silence was so weird. If you live in or around a forest, you hear wildlife all the time. The lack of it in such a dense area was strange. We crossed the creek and made our way through fallen trees and rocks until we found ourselves in a very wooded area. Adam had noticed first and pointed to a grouping of trees that made a perfect circle. Under the dead leaves lay stones, arranged in a circle, and in the center was broken bottles. I walked over to it and ended up tripping. I braced myself with my forearm and deeply cut it with a broken bottle. As I stood up, the silence was broken by a loud scream. It sounded human, female but it was a scream. 
And no, it was not a mountain lion or anything else. I know what the wildlife sounds like there. And it was nothing like that. This was a human woman screaming in the middle of the deep woods. I turned to where I thought it had come from, and beyond the trees, in the brush, I saw something red run off. We decided to head back. As we came back to the stage and pond area, a truck pulled up. The guy that was the only person living in the area ordered us into his truck to take us out of the area. He said that he owned that area and that he knew we were trespassing. He knew me, so he didn't give me a hard time or threaten me. He dropped us off, and I asked him how he knew we were there. He said, I didn't. I just heard some scream and thought some idiot fell in the pond. I ended up with stitches in my arm after going to the ER. I have only two explanations that might be plausible. The first is that we didn't know what was beyond the brush. It could have been a home, and maybe kids were playing. While the scream was loud and I saw something red running, we could have just startled someone. But the problem with that theory is that the guy who came in the truck heard it too, and we were far enough away from where he lived to where he would have had a hard time hearing it. The only other possible explanation I could think of is that the scream came from behind us, and because of the trees and acoustics, echoing made me think that it was coming from in front of us. This might account for how the guy had heard it too. His home is halfway to the stage area, which is why he was able to get there so fast. But that doesn't account for the red thing I saw, or what the scream was, in the first place. I can almost explain it, except that I still can't. From May 2010 to May 2011, I worked as a security guard at a hydroelectric dam in Virginia. It was a fairly isolated location. If you needed an ambulance, you could expect at least a 20 minute wait. About a month after I was hired, one of the guys at the dam told me that most security guards out there quit after a few days because they got so creeped out being alone at the dam at night and he was glad I was sticking it out. In truth, it could be creepy. Sometimes at night, when I was patrolling the basement level of the dam itself, I'd think about the fact that I was 50 feet below the waterline on the low side, the only human being in about a mile and a half radius. Sometimes I'd even hear weird noises in the woods, or catch a flash of a shadow while I was inside the dam. It takes a lot to scare me though, and I knew that I was either hearing critters in the woods, or my mind was playing tricks on me. One night, however, something happened that scared the living hell out of me. It was a little after 11 p.m., and I was sitting in the guardhouse reading a book. Suddenly, I heard a tap at the door. What was creepy about the guardhouse at night was that when you had the lamp inside turned on, people could look through the windows at you, but the glare made it difficult for you to see outside. When I heard the tap at the door, I thought it was a bug hitting the glass. It was so faint, and I knew that there weren't any contractors at the dam. I had the place to myself. Then the tap came again, more insistent this time. I grabbed my flashlight and opened the door. There was no one there. Then I let the door slip from my hand and shut behind me. To my left, previously concealed by the door as I had opened it, was a huge man at least 400 pounds, wearing a gray sweatshirt and gray sweatpants. The sweatshirt was smeared with fresh blood. My heart started hammering. My blood ran cold. I was so scared I couldn't speak. As it turns out, he was a local fisherman who had been fishing off the bridge over the tail race, and he was wondering why the power company hadn't started back pumping into the lake yet because they usually started a little before 11, and that was what always drew in the big striped bass. He was smeared with blood because he'd already caught and gutted a couple and wiped his hands on his shirt. He felt really bad when he realized that he had approached me basically in the same way that a murderer in a horror movie would have. I am thankful to this day that I was unarmed security, because if I'd had a gun, I would have either shot him 
or accidentally shot myself while trying to shoot him. And to shoot. Last year, I had a very strange experience in a national forest out in California. I was by myself on a road trip with my dog, and I was driving pretty far into Mendocino National Forest. I like to camp in national parks and forests because it's isolated, so my dog can roam and they're free of charge. A trade-off for sketchy and rough drives into the parks sometimes, and the lack of service and assistance. Anyway, I was driving up this dirt road kind of curling up a mountain, maybe around 5 p.m. It was really nice out, sunny and warm with a slight breeze. Nothing serious happened, but I felt extremely uncomfortable driving into the area, and that feeling did not let up. Driving up the mountain, I felt like I shouldn't stay there and I even texted my boyfriend about it for as long as I could before my phone completely lost service. I was looking for a sign of another person having been around the area lately, but I didn't see anything. I pulled over and got out of my car with my dog to look over the edge, and I noticed a dead squirrel and some broken glass mixed in with the dirt and gravel road. Yucca, my dog, started to growl slightly. She's vocal, but I've almost only ever seen or heard her growl at or with other dogs. I did see her growl at a possum once, so it could be something she smelled, maybe. This place continued to make me feel quite on edge, but I pride myself in being an independent traveler and backpacker, so I decided to continue at least a bit further with my grumbling pup to see if I could find a good place to camp. I continued to notice more dead animals. Keep in mind, no one is going to be going more than 5 to 10 miles per hour up this thing, and that's if there's anyone even there. I hear men's voices. They sound close, and I think I should call out to them. So I stop my car, but then I kind of freeze up, and I feel like I shouldn't. I can't really make out what they're saying. I don't see any sign of people anywhere. And I get back in my car and continue to slowly drive forward, and cautiously look for where the voices could be coming from. I've never run into other people in a national park or forest when I've gone this deep in. The unsettling feeling grows about the voices, which have sort of come and gone a few times, and I give up and begin to turn my car around. I honestly don't remember how Yucca was acting on the way down. I was scared and just focused on getting out of there. I just distinctly remember being surprised at her grumbling when we were standing outside of my car. Kind of dangerously quickly, I went back down the mountain, not seeing any sign of anyone. I decided to spring for luxury and get a hotel for the night. I figured I was just fine. Huge and open spaces can be intimidating, I told myself. And the voices could have been echoing from somewhere far off, and they just sounded close. Animals die. Glass gets broken. Nothing happened. Cool. But I remember this place. It sticks with me. Whenever I'm watching scary movies, if I'm walking my dog in the woods at night, nothing compares to the feeling that I had driving up that mountain. And it's honestly kind of interesting to me, as well as frightening. I recently happened upon some information, as well as some Native American lore, that made me feel extremely uneasy. Fast forward a year, I've mentioned this place to a few people and the haunting vibes that it gave me, but not much more. I googled the national park once and didn't see anything, but I didn't look too much either. I like scary movies and things of that nature, hence my fascination with this little event. So my boyfriend and I were coming up on finishing up our road trip just yesterday. We were in Wyoming for a wedding. There were only two to three hours left, and the sun had set, so we decided to listen to some scary podcasts and YouTube videos. We went from the No Sleep podcast to the X-Files and ended up on a True Stories video dealing with Native American lore. I'm half paying attention, petting my dog, playing Pokemon on an emulator, and I hear the narrator mention Wendigos. Very briefly, says what they are, and K-1 
casually mentions that they can mimic voices. I mean it when I say that the most horrible chills I have ever had in my life crawled down my spine when I heard that. I stared at my boyfriend and asked him if he remembered that national forest I was freaked out about last year. He says he does, and he reminds me that he texted me I was probably close to a Wendigo. He did. I do remember him saying that, but I didn't know much about their lore and I thought he was just being funny, like, yeah, Bigfoot's probably stalking you, or some other dad joke. And he was like, no, I mean I was mostly joking, sure. But I said it specifically because you said you were hearing voices that you couldn't find a trace of. I feel super strange, and I start googling wendigos and skinwalkers, things like that. They are allegedly able to mimic human voices, and they would live in that sort of area. It all matched up. Obviously, there are a ton of questionable pieces of information out there, but I tried to find more reputable sources and websites and authentic experiences. I then specifically looked up missing persons in the area, and the first headline that catches my eye is, Another Family Goes Missing in Mendocino. I went through different websites and news articles of people going missing, but they're all hidden underneath national park websites and pictures of trees. I remembered looking up the forest about a year ago and I didn't see anything, until I realized these stories didn't really seem to be talked about that much, which also piqued my intuition and interest. It was stated that well over 100 people in the past 8 years have gone missing and not been found on top of many who are found dead. It just has my interest peaked, remembering how unsafe I felt and how much I wanted to get out of there terrifies me, and I felt so uneasy about what I was hearing, and I do to this day. My dog and I are very close. She was a stray that started following me one day, and I ended up bringing her home from Costa Rica, so her little growls along the way made me feel like there was something wrong. Even if it was just a storytelling video, the stories have to originate from somewhere, right? I've done a lot of solo traveling both in and outside of the country, and I've never had a feeling as bad as that one. On top of seeing an unnecessary amount of dead animals in a national forest, which just seemed strange. I don't know if I'll be doing more solo traveling unless it's a little closer to civilization. I just can't stop thinking about what would have happened if I had ignored my intuition that day. I used to live in rural Panama in a community with no electricity. The whole town is inside by sundown, around 7 p.m., and asleep by 9. One night, I'm outside at around 11 p.m. photographing stars, and I have to turn my headlamp off while the camera is taking the picture, usually about 30 seconds to 150 seconds at a time. 30 to 150 seconds of almost complete darkness. When I finish a photo, I'll turn my headlamp back on and look at my camera to adjust settings and take another shot. One time, when I turned my headlamp on, I saw a pair of eyes just about 15 feet away in the bushes staring at me. I've got friends who have worked setting camera traps throughout the country, and I've seen picture evidence that there are still several types of big cats alive and well in the area. I leaned down to pick up some rocks, looked back up, and the eyes were gone. My house was about a hundred feet away. I did my best to turn my handful of rocks and dinky tripod into weapons, and run as manly-like as I can back to my house. I never went back out to take pictures at night. When my buddy joined the Air Force, one of the first places he got stationed was Howard Air Force Base in Panama. The United States Air Force closed it in 1999, and it is now Panama Pacifico International Airport, near Balboa, at the entrance of the Panama Canal, I believe. Anyway. It was 1994, and he was in the security forces. There was a ten-foot-wide swath of jungle cut back on the outside of the fence, wide enough to drive a Hummer. So, when he was out on guard duty, they packed a bunch of guys up in a truck 
and they would drive the outside of the gate at the base. And then they would drive along the inside of the fence and drop a guy off every hundred meters or so. So when your shift began, you were dropped off on the jungle side of the fence with a rifle, one clip of ammo, a bag lunch, a radio, and night vision goggles. He was 19 years old and scared as hell, he said. At night, you could see eyes looking back at you. Cats screaming in the jungle, and all other sorts of boogeymen. He said that you might meet up with the guy in the area next to you if you both happened to be walking toward each other at the same time. So at least you might have another human to talk to in the dark. Apparently the main reason for guard duty on the jungle side of the gate was to keep the locals from stealing the copper ground wire off the fence. Fifteen years ago, I went camping with two school friends in bushland that backed onto my dad's property in Wurriyalik, Australia. My dad didn't spend much time at the house, but said we could use it as a base to dump any gear we might not need. He also gave me a heads up that he might creep up on our campsite that night and scare the guys I was with. We hiked from the house for about four hours through very dense bush, where we found a clearing and decided to set up our camp. Looking around the place for firewood, we kept turning up a lot of old bones, some so old they almost looked like wood. We concluded that due to the land once being used for farming, it was probably likely that they were cow bones. We came up with a few more theories for the sake of scaring each other, then built our fire, even burning a couple of the wood-like bones just to see what would happen, and then settled in. I was woken up by one of my buddies at about 1 a.m., who said he swears he saw a torchlight on the tent wall. Excellent, I thought. We sat in silence for a few minutes before the light came back. This was great. I really hammed it up, making up stories about murders in the area and escaped prisoners. The light from the torch fixed on our tent, then switched off. We could hear leaves and sticks moving around outside, and my buddies were on the verge of tears. Then we started hearing whispering outside, as well as some low mumbling. Dad must have brought some friends in on the prank. Dedicated. The torchlight came back on and pressed right up to the tent wall, and a hand began tapping across the top while the whispering continued. My dad had brought some friends in on the prank and convinced them to walk four hours through dense scrub in the middle of the night just to shine a torch on our tent. I started to panic. Then it just stopped completely about an hour after it began. We sat in total silence, aside from the sobbing of my buddies, and at dawn packed up and got the fuck out. We got back to the house and dad was there. He apologized and said he planned to come out and see us last night, but fell asleep at his girlfriend's house. We told him about what happened and he was genuinely dumbfounded. Interestingly, I went back to the spot a couple of years ago after telling this story to a friend. We found a small shack made of corrugated iron pockmarked with bullet holes, a 44-gallon drum full of burned clothes, a pile of firewood, and two axes. Who knows if it's related, but it was fucking creepy. This happened about 11 years ago when I lived in southern Montana. We have coyotes and an occasional mountain lion sighting, but no bears. My house was just a bit outside of town, and the neighborhood made a large circle. We had seen mountain lions on the cliffs behind our house, and coyotes a couple of streets farther back before. It was late summer or early fall, around two or three in the morning, when I decided to go for a walk, like I often did. Now, there was this spot on my walk that was large and open, a lot. It was a hill on a curved part of road, so you couldn't really see around it. On the other side of this area was a drained irrigation ditch. Now, this lot always gave me the creeps, and it wasn't just me. Everybody that I talked to didn't like this area. 
I had just gotten to this area when the asphalt turned to gravel and my flashlight went out. I heard a truck come barreling around the corner and the person driving slammed on the brakes right in front of me. I thought it was a little weird since I was on the side of the road, but then I realized that he wasn't looking at me. I turned to look toward the irrigation ditch, and that's when I saw them. Three large masses moved out from behind a tree. They had the ears and muzzles of a dog, or a wolf. Their bodies were muscular, but they were hunched and moving in a really odd fashion. They extended one claw forward, and then they would do like a hop-drag motion, like the rest of their body had to catch up. They all disappeared into the ditch. I looked back at the truck, and the guy stepped on the gas, kicking up rocks behind him as he sped off, leaving me in the dark. For a few moments, I was stunned, and then my flashlight flickered back on. It would have been faster for me to go home past the empty lot and irrigation ditch, but I sprinted the other way. A house from mine, there was an alleyway that went back to some caves with large lilac bushes lining the alley. As I was running by the alley, I heard rustling. I got to my house and went to fling open the sliding glass door when I heard a low growl from behind. I ran inside, shut the door, and shined the light into the bushes that the growl had come from. My light caught a reflection of eyes before they disappeared. I went back the next day. Based off of the tree that they'd come out from behind, they were about four feet tall when they were hunched. Where I saw the eyes would have been about seven feet tall. I did not go walking at night again after that. This summer, I was out in the dark canyon wilderness of Utah after two weeks of driving and backpacking around the country by myself. The plan was a seven-day trip, and after a few days of setbacks, I was on my last night. By this time, I was already a little scared of the dark, but that's just what happens when you're your only company for three weeks. Anyway, on the sixth day, I found an awesome elk antler, and I put it on my shoulders about a mile into the day's hike. As anyone who has poorly packed a pack will attest, just slapping 15 pounds on the top of your pack is a terrible idea. About halfway through my planned death march, my hip was getting sore, and I blew through my water. I decided that I would stop early and get some water. Luckily, I found a few puddles in a dryish riverbed and made camp. I started boiling some water when it struck me. If there's skanky water here, there might be good water upstream. So I went upstream. Just as the canyon boxed out, a little spring filled the bed with deliciously cold, refreshing water. I drank on my hands and knees before realizing that I didn't bring my water bottles. Whatever. I hiked the half mile or so back to the camp and grabbed them. This is where things got weird. On my trip back up, I kept feeling really vulnerable and uncomfortable. Every little rustle in the bushes set me off. I could hear birds calling in the distance. I kept looking for something following me. I can only describe my emotion as pure terror. It got to the point where I picked up a branch, just in case a cougar tried to attack me. I still kept telling myself that it was just paranoia and that I was fine, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. I finally got to the water and I filled up my camelback and my bottle, constantly looking over my shoulder. The feeling of unease was still with me when I headed back down to the gulch. There, I came upon a fresh mountain lion print placed directly between the two I had made on the way up. It's one thing to be afraid and to think that your fears are unfounded paranoia. It's another to find out that they were valid. My wife, my daughter, and I joined our troop for a Club Scout Halloween event at a Boy Scout camp in Colorado. It's a large hilly area tucked away in the canyons. 
There are lots of campsites up the hill, but farther down the road are some cabins. We were allowed to stay there for the night since it's more comfortable than the tents. Well, these cabins are about a quarter of a mile away from any of the other buildings or tent areas, so we're nowhere near the rest of the group, and it's just the three of us in the cabin. We get ready for bed, and as I'm starting to fall asleep, I realize how eerily quiet it is. It is completely still outside. No wind, no rustling of trees, no anything. Well, I eventually fell asleep. I am then awoken very suddenly by a scream inside the room. I sit up and I ask my wife if she's okay. She responds yes and checks on our daughter. She's also fine. It's now dead quiet again. No noise. The scream is gone. So, in a panic, I start walking around the room in the dark. There's nothing in the room but us. Maybe it came from outside. So I peek out the window and out the front door. No movement. Nothing. But it's pitch black and I can't really see anything either. Time to buck up the courage, grab my phone as a flashlight, and go check outside. I stand there frozen for a minute and finally work myself up to grab my phone and go outside. I grab my phone, turn on the screen, and I see a Halloween update alert from the Simpsons mobile game. What I had heard was Homer Simpson screaming from my phone because one of my buildings was done in the Simpsons game. Needless to say, I uninstalled that game and I haven't played it since. It took a good two hours for my wife and I to fall back asleep. 